Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Mason and let's hear some stories from Reddit. But before that, don't forget to press the like and subscribe so you won't miss any videos in the future. Or maybe leave a comment down below. That really helps the future of the channel and means so much to the effort that I put in every day. Now let's dive into the stories. First story, Mill lied about my baby gender. Now have to see my baby in the clothes they brought. November last year I, 30 female, gave birth to our first baby. It's the first in my family, and the sixth in my husband family, 30 to male. It's important to say that all the six kids are boys, and MIL is in some sick baby girl rabies. Ever since we made the announcement MIL convinced herself that I was pregnant with a girl. I told her that once we knew the gender she would be the first one to know. We told her it was a boy. She still was convinced it was a girl. She told the whole side of the family it was a girl. I corrected but she told them I was just annoyed bc I wanted a boy first. I wanted a healthy baby. I didn't have a damn about the intercourse. She also told them we are naming the girl after her mom, which we will never do bc hubby hates his grandma. When the baby shower gift started to come I noticed a lot of things that wasn't in the register. Embroidered things with grandma's name. And it didn't matter we told them the gender. And the name and made clear we are not lying about the gender. Everyone believed her. Well, the baby was born. And imagine the surprise. It was a boy, just like we have been telling everyone. The problem, for them, was that now the baby have plenty of girly clothes, pink onesies etc. And we are dressing our baby with them, especially for his family video calls, and for pictures for them. After Saturday call, MIL called us to scream to us BC we are making the elders uncomfortable for not sticking to a masculine color scheme for the baby clothes. And we have to stop being this childish. She just threw my belly shape was more like girl than for a boy. We told her we will not change the baby's clothes. And to just wait until the dress is fit. He will look adorable. Second story, call the maintenance guy to open the gate. Will do. Years ago, I lived in a trailer park. Manufactured home community. They were nice trailers. But they were still trailers. And during a summer when I inherited my dad's little fishing boat. I was informed I wasn't allowed to park the boat in our driveway. It fit completely in the driveway and did not hang out onto the road. When I mentioned that this rule was nowhere in my lease, they said oh, the rule was just changed this year. It'll be on your next lease. And it was, I asked what they expected me to do with my boat. And they said there's a community lot at the end of the block where tenants are expected to park their trailers and boats. You can park it there for free. Great, that'll free up space in my driveway. Then, I decided to play along instead of fighting it. And when I went to get my boat out of the lot that Saturday, the gate was locked. I impatiently stomp over to the office, telling them I wasn't told the gate would be locked. And I wasn't given a key to get my boat out. Oh, the residents don't get keys to that gate. Hold up. You're requiring me to park my boat there, but you're not giving me access to my boat. All you have to do is call the park maintenance guy when you need to get something out, and he'll come open it up. Now, I tried to argue with her about how inconvenient that is for literally everyone involved, and how it'd be so much simpler to just make a bunch of copies of the key, and sign one over to each person who has to keep something there. Hell, let me borrow the key right now, and I'll go down to the hardware store and I will pay to get my own copy made. You could even make us all sign for the keys, with a fee if we lose it. Sir, we don't do that for security reasons. If there are multiple keys floating around out there, anyone could get access to your boat. I decided to ignore how stupid that was, since if my boat was in my driveway, where I really wanted it, anyone could get access to it and that's what tongue locks are for. Smiled. And said you know what? You're right. I wasn't thinking clearly. Please give me the phone number for the maintenance guy, and I will just give him a call when I need to get my boat out. I went home and checked the weather for the weekend. Warm, sunny, and calm all Sunday. Sounds like a perfect day for fishing. And you know what, I want to make the most out of my fishing trip, so I'm going to get an early start. I woke up at 5 in the morning, got myself all ready, packed my gear into the back of my truck, and drove on over to the trailer lot. I then called the maintenance guy, who answers with a groggy, and clearly still half asleep, hello. Me and my best, shit-eating, chipper voice good morning. I was told I have to call you to get my trailer out of the lot. Him, it's like 5 in the morning. You're going to have to wait. Me, no, sir. I've got things to do today, and I need to get an early start. So I'm going to need to get into that lot now. Him, with noticeable irritation in his voice give me five minutes. 
About 10 minutes later he pulls up to the gate, very visibly disgruntled about the whole thing. I just give him a smile and a good morning. Him, as he's unlocking the gate you need your trailer to move tree limbs, or something. Me oh no, my boat's on it, and I need it for fishing. Him, that couldn't wait until a decent hour. Me no, my life doesn't revolve around your sleep schedule. Of course, if I had my own key to this gate, you wouldn't need to be here at all. I had a great day fishing. When I got back, the gate was no longer locked, and I never saw a lock on it again. Third story, you want me to cancel this job completely. Okay. My dad used to be field maintenance for the post office. Basically if a mail truck broke down, dad would go out with a special truck to tow it. Priority over all other things, usually. If post office machinery needed wrenching, dad did it. Moderately high priority. If a blue mailbox needed a paint touch-up, dad did it. Very low priority. One day dad gets sent on a job out into a post office, in the boonies. Nearly a 3.5 hour long drive. One way, if traffic was favorable, this job was to ray paint the parking lot. You can figure that this job wasn't exactly high priority, so they've already been waiting quite a while for it to happen. Dad gets to the site, and the equivalent of the floor manager gets snippy with Dad, telling him that he was just going to have to sit on his hands and wait for two more hours. Apparently floor manager had some project planned for that day that would require moving a bunch of stuff outside temporarily, using up the parking lot space. He fully expected my dad to stand around and wait for this job to be done. Dad, you filed a work order, and you have been scheduled for this job for a while now. You knew what date I was going to be arriving. I am here, floor manager, pompously. You are going to wait. Dad, no, I am not. I'm starting the job I was sent to do. Dad spins on his heel and heads for his work truck to grab the equipment. The floor manager charges outside, screaming at the top of his lungs. Floor manager, you will not paint this right now. You will paint when I say you can paint, and I say you will wait two hours. Dad, looking absolutely pissed, if I put my equipment back in my truck, I will close the work order, and you will have to file another one. The floor manager storms inside and returns with the postmaster of that post office. A spineless, sniveling, hand wringing, twig of a man. Postmaster, look, I know you're here to do this job we requested. But really, is it so much to ask for you to wait until this project is finished? It's only two hours. Dad, icily, I drove three and a half hours to get here. Either I start right now and head for my home base on time, or I close the work order and end the job. The postmaster whimpers and wheedles and wrings his hands, then nods, close the work order. I'll file another job order and you can return tomorrow. Dad smiles thinly, nods and climbs back in his truck to head back to his home post office. He then calls his own postmaster and explains what happened. His postmaster, well, give them what they want. Close the work order. Now here's the malicious part of the compliance. Dad and only eight other guys covered an area of approximately 150 miles or so. So yeah, way understaffed. Also, in order to get any requested jobs done, there was a whole bureaucratic mess to make it happen. You had to write up a work order, send it in, get put on a waiting list, and hope that a bunch of broken down trucks didn't bump you farther down the list than you already were. If your work order was closed, whether or not it was actually completed, the job was considered fulfilled, which means that it could not just be reopened. They would have to file a completely new work order and be listed accordingly in the many, many higher priority jobs. Since this post office was out in the boondocks with an extremely low priority job on a very understaffed workforce, They've essentially shot themselves in the foot by refusing to let dad get started immediately. I can neither confirm nor deny that their new work order mysteriously dropped to the bottom of the list of priorities a few more times than necessary. But I can confirm that it was at least a further three months before that parking lot got painted. The floor manager made himself scarce, and the spineless postmaster was very, very quiet when he signed off on the work order's completion. Fourth story, want to make my job as in raw harder. I will make sure you are up all hours of the night alongside me. I went to school and immediately became the world's worst raw resident advisor on a college campus to avoid moving back home. Instead of being in a normal hall with crazy freshmen, I was put into a complex that had grad students, people with children, and some others mixed in. I was pretty relaxed about the rules unless someone was making it hard on someone with young kids. The setup of the dorm was more of a complex. Seven different stacks of apartments with four floors and a connecting basement. 
You couldn't walk from one section to another continuously. You would need to go downstairs and exit the building then come back in at another entrance. This is important to note. You can't even get to the office with all the keys without leaving the building. The rules said that we needed to be on call, ready to let in drunks who lost their keys, respond to emergencies, etc. From the hours of 8 p.m. 7 a.m., and you needed to sit in the office from 8 p.m. midnight and complete rounds around the building throughout the night. Even though I was pretty relaxed about the rules, I was able to intervene in some scary situations and help out. The craziest call was an armed robbery in the hall next door. I've also had crazy girls bite people and tweak out trying to jump out windows. Anyways, my direct supervisor tried to make it as easy as possible for us to do our jobs. There was a phone in the office that you could forward to your cell phone so that you could respond to calls anywhere on campus. I may or may not have gone to the art studio to work or gone to other buildings on campus to hang out until I received a call and would walk back to my building to help. Other halls did not have this luxury and needed to use either the office phone in their hall of and raw phone located in their room. Other RAs caught wind that we could forward it to our cell phones and complained. Remember I have a massive, multi-section complex with about 20 entrances and exits to patrol. Because of the size of the complex, if I were to follow the rules and only use my room phone, I would need to walk up and down for flights of stairs to make calls back to people, and I would be a good 5-minute walk away from the phone just while doing my mandatory rounds. On a peak weekend I received 81 calls in today's. The admins decided they wanted to force us to use the provided phones and not forward it to our cell phones. There was also a stern reminder that under no circumstances are we to leave the building without calling a supervisor first. Okay bet. I was the senior raw and told my coworkers that we were absolutely going to follow those rules and under no circumstances were we to leave the building without calling the supervisor. I reiterated that we needed to call them to let them know we were exiting the building no matter what time of night it was. Remember how you can't walk through the building without exiting and re-entering each of the seven parts of the complex. So for a few nights I made sure to call my supervisor every time I did a walk though of the building. That meant a minimum of 21 calls a night for the mandatory three walkthroughs of seven sections. I made sure my coworkers did the same. And that was on top of every single time someone was locked out. I needed to physically walk outside the complex to get to the office. I think it lasted one weekend, and the official rule book was change. Fifth story, just make the ground flatter, was reminded today of an incident from many years ago. At the time I was working for a large government contractor. Walking across the five-acre campus one day, I tripped over a bump in the ground, scraped my skin and sprained my wrist enough to require a brace. Per company protocol I immediately took myself over to the medical office for treatment and to fill out the stack of paperwork including the 27 8x10 color glossy pictures with circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one. One of the questions asked what could be done differently to prevent this in the future. Being in a serious corporate job I couldn't just tell the shrink I wanted to kill. So the best sarcastic response I could come up with on how to prevent tripping over a bump in the ground in the future that wasn't going to cost me my job was make the ground flatter. The medical staff smirked. I smirked. The corporate beast was satisfied. Several days later, on the weekend, I was escorting my parents around the facility so they could see where I worked. We walked past a crew cutting a square of bumpy asphalt out. The very bump I had tripped over. Remember the 27 8x10 color glossy pictures with circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one. They then refilled the square hole to make the ground flatter. Of course being a government contractor, maliciously complying with my suggestion to make the ground flatter wasn't exactly something they could do correctly. The patch job was about half an inch lower than the surrounding asphalt, and actually became an even bigger trip hazard. But that's someone else's malicious compliance to deal with. Last story, the rule says you're not allowed to ride your bike on school property. Okay, this happened at a school I work at. I decided to start riding my motorcycle to work as the weather in the UK has finally brightened up and I like to go for a ride after work in the sunshine. Anyway, I park my bike in the correct area and secure it so everything is fine until home time comes around I get asked to come to the school office. Apparently, one of the school administrators, proper jobs worth, Saw me come in on my motorcycle and wasn't happy because no to wheeled vehicle may be ridden on school property without prior consent. Okay I said and walked out the office. I had customized my bike to be very light and its nickname is the Softail Superligera so pushing my bike to the gates wouldn't be a problem. So I push my motorcycle out the school gates before starting it up but while I'm doing this a bunch of the students ask why. So I tell them the rule and they mention how dumb it is. 
The next day, a bunch of students decided to come on their 50cc scooters and make a scene outside of the school. But once they are on school property they pushed their scooters over to the bike rack and secured them. Best bit, the administrator in question rode a push bike to school, so the scooter squad stopped her, recited the rule, and made her get off her bike and push it to the bike rack. She was aghasted by how many students had brought their scooters to school, but the rule only applies to riding. Pushing and parking them in the bike rack once on school property is perfectly within the rules. Update, the rule has been suspended pending a rule review to be held over the summer holidays. The headmistress also thinks that this would be a golden opportunity to have road safety week leading up to the summer holidays. Sure, whatever, knock yourself out. That's it for the story, thanks for watching.